Good morning, everybody, and welcome back. My name is Lisa Jarrett, and as you know, I'm one of the co-founders and co-directors of KS MOCA, or the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, we are an art museum inside Dr. MLK Jr. School in Northeast Portland, Oregon. It's a functioning public school. Um, and I'm joined today by my co-founder and co-director, Harold Fletcher, and Amanda Lee Evans, who is one of our primary collaborators. Um, this is part of our 2021 remote visiting artist lecture series and um, artist in residence program. We're delighted to have Paula Wilson back for her third lecture in the series. Um, and today we have a guest along with her, Mike Lagg. We'll hear about that in just a minute from Mo. Um, but before we turn it over to Mo for the introduction, I want to extend a warm, warm welcome to all of the Dr. MLK Junior School students who are joining us via our YouTube live channel. Uh, MLK Junior students, feel free to put any questions you have for Paula or Mike in the chat, and we'll get them to them so that you can hear the answers um, when you have a chance to uh, either go back and watch it or as you're watching the streaming um, the streaming presentation this morning. I also want to make sure to give a huge heartfelt thanks to uh, the folks at Dr. MLK Junior School that support our work, including Principal Jill Sage, Paige Thomas, Michelle Peake, Nancy Rios, and Mr. Monty, who likes to remind us to get a little bit of exercise every day. Um, so thanks to everybody out there who has been supporting this amazing work over uh, this, this very strange year. And uh, without further delay, I am going to invite Mo to tell us a little bit about the artists that we're going to be hearing from today. Hi, Mo. Speaking of exercise, today I have PE and I probably am going to mow the lawn. So I have an exercise today. Well, everything is peaceful during this thing, but not really, really much. There's still quackadoodle doing. But hi, I'm Mo. I go to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. School. I'm also the head photographer for KS Mocha, which is right here. Today, I'm introducing two artists. Hooray. Paula Wilson and Mike Ledge. Leg. They both live in Carrizozo, New Mexico. I want to go there. We, today we are going to learn how to make art in one hour. Uh, I made it in two seconds. Paula is a black biracial woman. Ooh. Who was born in Chicago. She likes to learn many layer, many ways of making art so that people can see it from a lot of perspectives. This means she is complex, like moi. And also really fun. Complex is fun. Fun is complex. Paula even likes to make her own clothes. I really like that shirt. I want it. Mike is an artist who likes to work with wood. Wood is awesome! He taught himself how to do th that. He likes to make things out of recycled wood too sometimes paula and mike make art together like that tool belt he i think we'll learn more today last time we learned how plants and insects are important to paula and her art today is a new adventure welcome paula and mike thank you for being here today something um I actually have something that was carved by a family friend. It's a Joseph, and they're some they're originated in China and Japan. Mo, thank you for that amazing introduction. We loved it. You're getting better and better. And as we know each other more and more, it's like the introduction is infused with even more information. And welcome everybody. As Mo is saying, I'm Paula. And I'm Mike. Nice to meet you guys. What? Who's that? <laughs> That's our rooster. In fact, here we it's are. It's dinner. It's dinner <laughs> in our chicken coop. See our roosters and chickens? They're happy to see you here. This is where we started our first tour, so we figured we'd start here again. So, as we were saying, oh, and I don't want to forget. Our dog, Duchess. Say hi, Duchess. <laughs> oh, so cute. Okay, so we're gonna make art today. 
and we, we got to get started, right? Because it's like time's a wasting. But as Mo said, art doesn't necessarily take a certain amount of time to make, right? Like you can make art, like Mo was saying, in two seconds, or you can spend your whole life on one piece, making it perfect, continuing to work on it again and again. So this is something that we like to do, but today we're gonna try, we'll see if we can do it, to make an artwork in the time we have here with you at KS Mocha. So I want to make a print, a woodblock print. So this is a piece of wood that I'm gonna, that I'm gonna draw on and then Mike's gonna cut it out and then we're gonna print it. So what, what, what is the subject matter of my, of my art gonna be? Well, the thing I'd like to do since I'm here in this chicken coop and pigeon coop is draw, is draw a pigeon. So we have these special kind of pigeons here that we got locally and they're called fantail pigeons because they have a beautiful fan. I'll show you in a moment. Now these pigeons are actually considered to have a deformity, but that's not how we see it. We see this, this spanning of their feathers is actually something that makes them special and beautiful. And I wonder if there are things about you that you feel like maybe people don't see the value in, but you know the value in them because that they make you who you are. And some people might say that that thing is, is bad or not cool, it doesn't fit in with the way everybody is normal, but who wants to be normal anyways? So I'm gonna draw one of these fantail pigeons. I'm gonna switch my camera so that Mike can film as we're going and we can show you what these pigeons look like. All right, here, first I'm just gonna show. So here are the pigeons. See, now there's two pigeons there, right? One is a fantail pigeon. He's showing off his whole array to you. And the other is a rock dove, which you probably have in Portland. Wow, they're so beautiful, right? Oh, look, they're showing off for you. Okay. Cool. Draw the pigeon. Get this shape. I like the way their beaks are. Oh, the pigeon is being such a good model for me. So I like to, you know, do a loose sketch and then start to build with a darker line once I start to feel confident with what I have down. And this pigeon's got a nice little kind of crown. What do you think, Mike? I I think it's awesome. All right. I like it. What? You do, Mo? Anything? Any suggestions? Yes, I, do. I do have a suggestion. You could, since it's like showing off, you could like draw um um if it's like a breeding season you could draw a female on another page, a female. I love That's that idea. I love that. Okay, but we only have one hour, so we'll have to save that for next time. Okay, I'm gonna take over the camera for Mike, and he's gonna take that into his wood shop. All right, this, this is cool, I love this. Look at the beautiful blue New Mexico sky. Okay, Duchess, go on. Maybe that's...
No, Duchess, we're going this way. Come on. Come on. Duchess, you can do it. Follow. <laughs> wow, this wood shop looks amazing. Doesn't it, Mo? Imagine all the sculptures you could make in here. I okay, would. so one thing that we also are inspired by in our art practice are sounds. There have been so many sounds already. So we had the rooster, we had duchess, and now we have the sound of a drill. I guess that's pointing out the facial features or? Yeah, what, what, what was that, Mike? I am going to cut the outline of this pigeon out. And uh, then that's what we're gonna use as our printing block. Yeah, so he needs the hole so he can get the saw inside the wood. This little blade. Okay, so now we're about to have another sound coming to you, the sound of a scroll saw. Now this is gonna last a little while, so get ready. Bye, and you can everyone. see, you can, oh, bye Mo, thanks so much. And You're you can welcome. see how Mike is so skilled at this. He can, he can draw with a scroll saw as if it was a pencil. So this is a blade. Okay, maybe that doesn't show up so much. All right, here we go. The darker line, is it? Yeah. I have to interpret a little bit. Can I hear some applause? Woo! Great. <laughs> All right. We just got to get his uh, feet a little off. Okay. And we're going to save this piece too. And his eye, absolutely. Sometimes it's these little details that make all the difference. Mm. 
Notice I'm not too afraid of cutting my finger off with this saw because it's a, it's a scroll saw and it's, it's virtually impossible to cut your finger off. <laughs> 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 Don't brag now, or maybe we should say knock on wood. <laughs> okay, so now it's time to head over to the print shop. I'm going to give Mike the camera. Anything else you want to show in the shop? Um, show them the vultures now that we're on a bird. A bird uh, bonanza. They're little sort of puppets, flatten their vultures. I'm making a whole series of them. There's another one. Vultures are actually a sign of spring in New Mexico. The vultures come before the robins, and that's when we know that it's springtime. Come on, Duchess. That looks like a goose, you'd be right. What does this look like? My last lecture was about the yucca and the yucca moth, and the insects, and the, the state insects. This is beautiful butterfly wings that Mike and I collaborated with. One edge is wood, and then this is painted fabric. Beautiful. Now I'm just gonna do a little wood carving, add some details here. Paula, what is that tool that you're using? This is called a chisel. So it has a groove in it and I apply pressure and it cuts out pieces of the wood. These are made in Japan. I love these tools so much. And if you were doing this, I would think I would want you to be a little bit more careful and have some more safety precautions, but I am a master, an expert at this, so I can just do it free form. All right, that looks good to me. Awesome, let's print it, Paula. Okay, let's do it. So I want to do a different color for the background than the pigeon itself. And I wonder if anybody would like to see any particular color pigeon. We can, I want it to be natural. We can do white or gray or black. Well, it seems like it was a black pigeon. All right, let's do it. I think that'd be beautiful. I'm going to do a red background because I think black and red is really nice together. And here we have another sound in our soundscape, the sound of ink and a roller. So this is called a brayer. It's 
This is almost like a jigsaw, uh, like a puzzle. Do one piece. Okay, take it over here to my press. So this is my handy printing press. Roll things through, it has a ton of pressure and it makes an impression. I'll show you. We're gonna print on muslin, which is a thin cotton fabric, which is my material of choice in my art. Here we go. Ta-da! I think wow. it looks great. That's beautiful. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> I'm going to print one more. Sometimes there's ink remaining on the block. And you can get what's called a ghost print. That's so neat. Okay. Wow, I think we're moving right along with our making art today in one hour. Why do they look so different, Paula? So this is the first one that I sent through the press, which absorbed all the ink. And then this one, it had this block had less ink on it. And so when I printed it, it was not as what we call saturated. So the ink was less. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so do you sometimes do that on purpose? Yeah, I mean, sometimes I like to print a ghost in order to create depth in a piece. Here, I'll show you. So. If you see, certain of those yucca branches are darker than others. So this here is like a ghost print. And then that makes it almost look like it's further back in space. It gives it dimension. And then this, is a ghost print as well. You see how this is lighter than that? And sometimes I like to include in my art things like the ghost print and variation so that it doesn't look like it was machine made, that it, it has a feeling like it's by it, made by hand and that there is, you know, almost like em embracing mistakes, if you will. So, <laughs> The sky is falling out there. Another, another sound we have is Duchess barking. She's a studio dog, so she's always letting us know something's going on. Now, while I feel like this is really cool and I'm really excited, I feel like it came out good. Artwork sometimes isn't really called done until it's ready to hang on a wall or framed or ready to present in some way. So sometimes in my art, I like to make what I call faux frames. It's sort of almost like a joke that the, the frame, which, which makes an artwork feel fancy and finished, is actually part of the artwork. So here's an example. So 
So I have this landscape collage. And then this is also another woodblock print that is flat. So it looks like it's a frame, but it's actually really just a part of the painting. And that's something that excites me, like a little bit of a trickery. So I'm gonna make a frame around this pigeon print. It's a little bit like a cooking show. I've already got this prepared for you. I wish I could frame things that quick. <laughs> now, this, um, this fabric piece has a heat sensitive archival glue on the back. Archival means that it will age well. And it's called Fusion 4000, this stuff. And I iron it onto the fabric and then it's ready to be reheated with an iron to glue it. And you already got your iron on? I do, I just turned it on. Cause I don't wanna waste electricity. Irons take up a lot of electricity. You have to be careful not to get iron on the ink. I do. This is so fresh. We just made it. If I if I put the iron on that area, it would smear. Ouch. Paula, is this a similar process to uh, how you create the patterns on your clothing? Yeah, it is a similar process. I, this is what is called a monoprint. And actually this is a ghost print. You can see it's kind of light. Um, and so this was made by painting ink on a piece of plexiglass or a piece of plastic sheet and then running it through the press. So I also use the press a lot to make my clothing. And then my pants are also printed. So you could print on your pants if you sat on your print right there, right now. <laughs> okay. So you're gonna cut it out? I'm gonna cut it out a little, it's already ready. And I'm gonna hang it up and we can take a look at it. I think this might be more like art in 30 minutes. How are we doing on time? I don't yeah, this is amazing. Ta-da! <laughs> Wow, I can't, I can't believe it. That's unbelievable. <laughs> so I think with a little bit more time, we'd like to take you guys outside and show you some of the games we play in order to keep creative in our studio zone. And I'm gonna just pan by a few artworks that I'm working on. This is a large yucca figure. I think you'd like that hair, Lisa, if you could see it up close. Oh my God, you have no idea what's happening to me right now. Thank you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> and here's another painting I'm working on. And this, that was a yucca and this is a choya plant.
And this is a Dimba headdress that I use. And that's another wood block print. So I ran that through the press. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about the headdress? Yeah, the headdress is from the Baga people in Africa. And I was so, I made this block probably 20 years ago before I had even learned a lot about this headdress, but this is uh, an example of female power. She is the most beautiful, powerful, iconic, life-bearing goddess, really. And I love setting her up here in this painting as in a triumphant position, sort of looking over the land. And I think of this cactus as kind of protecting her. I still haven't painted the thorns on it. So as promised, let's go outside for a sec. What is this happening? is a coffee can game that Mike make, plays to try to get the coffee cans to go through the door. You try again. It has to be, it has to get at least two sides before it gets to the door. Oh, right. It has to ricochet. One. There we go, we got one. Woo! Uh -huh. Yay! Went through the door. <laughs> and let me show you this is a, a starry sky that I printed. And I'm uh, hanging it out here to dry. So this is the back of our studio. This is our recycling pit. Sure. I've got it really easy. Woo, another great sound. Okay, I'm going to give it a go and then we can open it up for questions. Yay, well, we were we tied. We were both did two for three. Yeah, let me show you what it is that we're throwing this at and show you a little bit more of, of this. But and then we'll and then we'll sit down and we could take questions. But this is our recycling pit. And we have an art organization, Momazozo, and every Friday people come and they bring their glasses. And then we smash bottles and play a game. And they can also bring cans because there isn't any uh, glass recycling in New Mexico. So people come here and we make a game out of it. And it feels really good to smash bottles. Okay. Where should we sit down for questions? Okay, we're gonna go inside. So this building was built as a Ford garage. And then there was a microbrewery making beer in here for a while. And now it's our art studio. We've got a beautiful jasmine plant that really loves it here and climbs all the way up the wall. These are lemon plants. 
But in Portland, Oregon, you have tons of beautiful things growing all the time. So I've been wondering, what are you? Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe Lisa, you'd. Yeah, sure. Um, I have some questions coming up in the chat for you all. Thank you just for such an amazing tour. And there's a question for Mo too. And now I see your necklace and now we have a whole other conversation. <laughs> um, Tenzin says, so I've been wondering, what are you guys, what's your guys' favorite type of bird? Um, I love pigeons. So I was incredibly excited about the pigeon print. I was also wondering, did you print the pattern for the fabric frames that you use on your pieces? A few questions. Wow, here. I love these questions. Okay. <laughs> Your favorite bird, Mike? Um, it would have to be the pigeon for sure. Yeah, um, they're, I feed the wild ones as well, just just because I enjoy the sounds they make and they just they add life life to the place and uh, yeah, they're cool. I would say that my favorite bird is actually the vulture. Um, they they're just so silent. And the way I can see them out in the landscape and in the sky, just gliding along and knowing that they're kind of a part of this natural process of life and death and that they, they help kind of clean uh, the, the rotting animals that, that might have been died out in the wild. So I, I kind of, I mean, I feel like a lot of people think vultures are sort of scary or gross or something, but to me, they're really majestic. They're really magical. And then, yes, I absolutely printed uh, a very similar process to the pigeon. I printed the frame pattern, the faux wood pattern uh, as, as a wood block. Thank you so much. Um, Nicholas is curious to know, how big of a theme is experimentation and having fun in your practice? He loves seeing the games that you play to get your creative juices flowing. Oh God, that's a, it's tough to put that in a percentage uh, other than maybe uh, uh, how about 99.9% .9 maybe. <laughs> uh, it seems like we don't find chance to find time to do work half the time, but I don't know, what do you think Paul? Um, I feel like, I'm in experimental play mode, yeah, most of the time. I mean, there's, you know, a lot of cleaning up and organizing and these kinds of things, which is also a good part of the artistic practice. I mean, but I feel like uh, I don't know ahead of time what, I'm, what my art is gonna be. And so it feels like it's all kind of experimentation and play really at the end, because I'm not, clear where I'm gonna end up. And so I need that sort of uh, sense of, of adventure to kind of keep me going and to keep me searching for, for what the meaning is. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It seems so, so deeply integrated into how you both work, um, whether it be individually or on collaborations, um, projects that you build together. Um, we have another question and I love this question. This is from Janet Marie. And she says, I don't have a scroll saw but is there a way I could make my own pigeon print at home? Um, yeah, absolutely, Paul, you can uh, definitely. Yeah, what I would do if I, was, if I was at home trying to make a print is I would use a potato. So you cut, you can cut a potato in half and then you can um, kind of carve away, I guess that's another knife situation, but like if you can make a stamp, then that's a way to make to make a pigeon print, right? So it might not be on wood, but sometimes people use uh, erasers because they make a nice stamp. Uh, or you could even do like a stencil with paper. So you could cut a pigeon out of paper and then brush the ink over it and lift up the stencil and you would have an outline of where, of where the pigeon was. We were thinking about that today when we were doing when we were doing this. We we're like, well, it's so exciting to be able to show you what we make, but we realize that you might not have these tools. You know, you don't have a press. You might not have a scroll saw, and yet we don't want that to be prohibitive or to stop you from thinking that you can make 
art in an hour as well, or less than an hour, it turns out. So I think that it's really important, again, to experiment and try new things. And, and even just if, if in your mind you tried to say, like, how could I make that without those materials? You might end up with something totally new and you might fail as you go, but that's part of, part of the art making process. Thank you. That's really exciting. JM, I hope that you try a potato print. Um, maybe we'll do it in class together. That would be a lot of fun. Um, I have another question here from Orion. And he says, I love seeing the way you collaborated on the woodcut. How much of your work is collaborative versus separate practices that sometimes overlap? I think I'd have to call it separate practices that sometimes we collide on things. Um, we, we uh, the, the projects that we do collaborate on are things that kind of just get passed back and forth. We're, we're never working like in the same space, usually. <laughs> it's usually, um, uh, well, oftentimes I'm, yeah, I, I don't know how to say it better. Yeah, I think that that's, that that's true. Like you saw that Mike's shop is in one area and now we're in my studio space. It's a long way away when you gotta come get a, a hand or something. You gotta make sure you need it. Although Mike put in a, a bell uh, uh, so I can I can ring him and it's like a bell shaped like a shovel. So it's- uh... And she has yet to ring it. So, and, and so she never really needs me. Either. But beyond that, I would say that um, that our art, art and life is really merged in, in so many ways that we can't even kind of unpeel. For example, at our house, all the plates and even the forks and spoons and knives are made of wood. And so, you know, while this might not be something that we're like actually collaborating on, I'm eating my meal on plates and cutlery that Mike made, or we're wearing clothes that I made. And so there's this kind of fluidity of living with each other's art that fuels our art making. And so that's kind of where the collaborative spirit feels super strong and difficult to kind of separate where he begins and I start. Thank you so much. Yeah, when Paul is making a delicious meal, um, my I collaborate by eating eating it, and, so. And doing the dishes usually. Well, What's yeah. your favorite meal? What's your favorite meal that she makes, Mike? <laughs> uh, chicken. <laughs> chicken dinner. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah, chicken Sorry dinner. About that. Um, <laughs> This is another question and this one's for Mike. Tenzin's wondering, how did you first get into woodworking and how long have you been doing it? Um, I've been doing it over uh, 30 years and I, I think I got into it as a, as a hobbyist kind of thing and bought some small hobby type tools with scroll saw being one of them. And I made uh, just kind of little, little models of uh, like wagons and whatnot. Now we've got another sound coming here. We have uh, our train, Carrie which, Zozo. Which we never try to talk over. So we should dance. I noticed that sounds came up so much in your in your talk today, um, and I'm wondering uh, if you all could talk a little bit about how sound influences your work. It seems like it's a really active part of the way you pay attention to your surroundings. Uh, how sound plays into our work, you know, like that we were. And did you finish on the on how you got into woodworking? Um. Well, and then I just uh, had extra time when I was uh, at one point in my life and, and had a wood shop available to me and had a little bit of knowledge um, at that point and was able to uh, move on to 
to constructing larger things. So I, I, I was very lucky to have that that extra kind of space that it needs. A wood shop, you have to have a wood shop before you can start making stuff out of wood, unfortunately. <laughs> and then the sound question, I feel like it's, I'm really, I mean, I noticed it in this environment, right? Where we're, uh, where the sound is kind of being trans sent, sent over to you and the, uh, the I don't know, the Zoom or the YouTube live makes all sounds equal. Whereas when we're in person, it's easier to kind of uh, tune your ear to a person talking or, but at the same time, there's many sounds that help inform my work. Like for example, when I was printing and rolling out the ink, the way I know the most, if I have the right amount of ink or I need to add more ink is the sound it makes. If it's too tacky, too staticky, that's too much. And if it's too quiet and just like a whisper, then that's too little ink. Do you have any sound? Uh, no. No, but the train <laughs> is a big sound, a big part of our lives. Uh, Carrizozo, the town that we live in was built because of the railroad and we live on one side of the railroad track. So we walk over to our studio and when we go home, we walk over the tracks again. And so uh, it, it feels like it, it's like a rhythm or a sound, or I like to say punctuates mm -hmm. uh, our day. Yeah. I, had a, I had a question. Um, I, just, I just got this book about Nikita Safal. Um, and I'm not sure if you all are familiar with her work and her collaborations with her partner, Jean Tangley, but I was just seeing some similarities between um, their work and your work and this sort of like um, lifestyle integration and you know making even like architectural projects that are part of work and, and all of these you know, various elements that that are part of both everyday and sort of like fantastical sort of merging together. So it just seemed like I was just looking at this book yesterday and really I recommend it to everyone, but also was seeing some similarities. I was wondering if that was somebody that you were familiar with or interested in. Yeah, the, I, I'm inspired by their work for sure. And um, I like to think about how, how artists are, are not people who stand by themselves and, and make and make their work um, that really the whole, the true spirit of art making is a kind of collaborative process with artists of the past and with artists of the future potentially. And so, you know, there's, there's multiple artists that I feel like come up for me, especially in the way that they merge art and life or um, have, have a kind of um, a very lived artistic practice. Like they don't, there's not a clear separation. Like my art exists here in the, in the museum on a wall that it can also exist in our home or uh, on our bodies. And, and I think of Andrea Zatel as somebody who, you know, who's also in the desert. And I like to, to think not necessarily like how I'm different from these artists or how the way we live and work is different from them, but how, how, how we're similar, how we're kind of all trying to build this ethos uh, together. Thanks so much. That, that really makes so much sense in the context of everything that you shared today, but also um, the things that you shared last time when we were talking about that kind of symbiotic relationship between the yucca and the uh, the insight, you know, so it's all these different ways of understanding and exploring how relationships show up and shift what we make and what we do. And I think that that's such a beautiful way of approaching work. Um, did you have a thought there, Paula? It looked like you I just love that. that. I just love the, the way you tied that together. I, I feel it's that. A, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's really wonderful to see all of the different ways um, that these ideas show up in your life and in your work together um, and individually. Um, JM was wondering what your favorite part of your studio is. And I think that's a question for each of you. Um, so 
I like that. <laughs> it's a hard one. I'm like the swing right here that I have. <laughs> Mike, did you make that swing? I've been dying to ask. I did, yes. <laughs> That's yeah, I, 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 I've made everything that you've seen made out of wood. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I want to show my, my tool belt. Oh, I have this in the wrong thing. So usually my cell phone is in here, but right now we're using my cell phone. And then I got my trusty scissors and a pin thing. It's really amazing. Where, where are Paula? So, you know, I think my favorite part of my studio is um, is the, where this table area where I um, where I ironed on the frame. And the reason is, in one way is that, is that this table I love, it's like this giant table that Mike made and it's on wheels and it's got a, a drawer underneath with all my supplies. It's like everything's there that I need. But then also the sun comes in in the morning and we come to work every morning into the studio and it hits my back as I, as I work. And just that, it's just this feeling of having everything that I need before me and having the sun kind of warming my back is, is a beautiful feeling and, and space. Yeah, it looks very cozy there, Paul. It, it's, I, like, I like how it, the sun is hitting you on the back. <laughs> Mine would be, uh, it changes uh, from season to season. And in the winter time, I'm looking for a place in the sun. And, uh, and, and lately, or at least soon, we'll, I'll be looking for a place in the shade to work. Um, but I, I have uh, like 10,000 square foot hotel space that you only saw a portion of that I consider my studio. So um, I, I can move around from one season to another pretty easily. I would, I would say for you, Mike, that your favorite studio space is outdoors. Uh, right now, definitely it is. I'm, I'm always trying to do something out, outdoors, whether it's constructing or land sculpting or, or planting, uh, taking care of uh, gardening stuff. Um, okay, we have time for maybe just a couple of more questions. And Mike, I promised Mo that I would give you some time to think about this question and then ask you again. And oh. Mo, Mo is oh. wondering, Mike, can you make me a salmon statue out of wood? I think he would also be willing to accept a beaver. Um, and if not, what do you recommend that Mo start working on to maybe learn how to make their own? Um, uh, no would be my answer. <laughs> you, Paula might be able to do a salmon print. No, 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 wasn't, this question beaver, wasn't for me. This question print. was for you. <laughs> but I, I do not carve animals. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm more of a wood sander instead of a carver. Okay, so um, she, I, I think a potato might be a good uh, direction to head. A beaver potato? Yeah, start Car with the potato, Carve Mo. a potato. <laughs> um, or bar of soap. Or, I mean, I took, I, I, I've drawn alongside Mo, and I could see Mo making a paper sculpture, but that's 3D, you know, like mm -hmm. drawing each side and folding the paper so that it, it can stand up. Or if it's a fish, you know, maybe a- Origami. Or, origami or, or paper that's, that's stuffed, you know, for the salmon. And then you could staple the edges mm -hmm. of the salmon, but it, it would have that like fish um, body. I think I think you should work in materials Mo that that you have around you and not worry about you know it being out of wood or it being out of metal or something and see what see what you can come up with and then and then maybe if you've done a little bit of work maybe Mike will be more inclined to uh, to give more non-advice or or say no again. <laughs> 
Or I was thinking it, it could be inspired kind of by some of your printing techniques, Paula, where like the frames look like wood, but they're not in fact wood. And yes, so well, maybe that's yes. something you could think about too. Like how do you make your paper look like wood or look like fish or look like fur? and then mm -hmm. making it into a 3D object. So we'll, we'll work on that with Mo and see if maybe he comes up with something to send you guys pictures of, that would be Yay. Lovely. Um, so maybe just one closing question, you know, if there was something, this is, it's been such an amazing experience to have you as part of this, this project, Paula and Mike, we're so happy to have you here today too. We've heard a lot about you, so it's really nice to um, learn with you. Um, what would be some closing thoughts that you might want to share out with the Dr. MLK Junior School students who've been watching each of your lectures over the year? I, I, I really, well, I had a great pleasure of interacting with um, second graders uh, virtually. And what struck me was how each of the students, each of you are your own artists and you're already artists. And each of the students had a different style, a different way of organizing elements on a page. Some of the students were more 3D uh, oriented, were more interested in kind of like building Legos or building sculptures. And then some other people felt like they really like to use a dry erase board and just draw and, and, and erase and just draw real fluidly and others would work very slowly on pieces of paper. And so I feel like I learned so much seeing that, you know, because I interact with college age students when I'm teaching, it's, very, it's rare for me to interact with elementary school students. And so to see how even at such a young age, that the artistic spirit is there and that the, the kind of the uniqueness of each of you, I think is, is so exciting. And it's just to keep going and never let anybody tell you that your art is supposed to look a certain way or be a certain way, really feel the heart inside of you and the sense of adventure and excitement and, and go forth from there. Thank you so much. That is, um, I think, good advice for all of us at any age. Um, and we really just appreciate your time and the energy that you've spent with us. It's been so wonderful to learn um, about you and your work in this way, something I never would have expected. And we've certainly hoped that we have an opportunity to work with you in person um, sometime very soon. And we wish you both all the best out there in Carrizozo. And hopefully we can come visit. That's it. Well, well, yeah. Um, so we'll just say goodbye for today and to our students in the uh, Dr. MLK Junior School who are joining us on our live YouTube stream. Thank you all for being here. And if you do think of some questions that you'd like us to check in with Paula or Mike about later, we are more than happy to do that. Um, next week, we will have another talk. This is guest curated by the MFA in Art and Social Practice Program um, during the same time. So that'll be 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on our YouTube live channel. We'll look forward to that with an introduction um, by Mo as well. And we are quickly coming to a close of our 2021 uh, Remote Artist in Residency and Lecture Series here at KS Moca. We really hope that you've enjoyed everything. And um, we do have, I think, three more lectures coming up before we close out our year. So we'll look forward to seeing everybody again next week. And we hope